Huh. Okay. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Science Cafe. My name is Jenny King, and I work in public affairs here at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Our team is proud to produce and host the UT Southwestern Science Cafe series, along with my co-host, Charlandra Charlie Thompson and Javelin Castellanos, as well as tonight's speaker and our many UT Southwestern colleagues. We thank you for joining us. Science Cafes are online conversations where speakers take you on deep dives into the science behind healthcare. As an academic medical center, UT Southwestern brings research, health education, and patient care together into one institution. Tonight's program takes us into the topic of vision health and the variety of intricate biological and physiological processes that can lead to complex diagnoses and care with UT Southwestern faculty member, Dr. Kishan Patel. Before we start the program, I have a few housekeeping items to share. We are recording Science Cafe as well as live streaming it on the UT Southwestern Twitter page. Please mute your microphones. Thank you. We are connecting digitally through Zoom, and so consider leaving your camera on so we can see each other during Q&A. And finally, while we cannot answer personal medical questions, we welcome your general questions about tonight's topic. Throughout the next hour, please list your questions in the chat, and Charlie will address them with Dr. Patel after our presentation. And now I am very pleased to introduce our speaker. Dr. Kishan Patel is Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology at UT Southwestern. He specializes in diseases of the retina and vitreous, cataract surgery and complications, and secondary intraocular lens implantation. Dr. Patel earned his medical degree at UT Health Science Center in Houston and completed a residency in ophthalmology at UT Southwestern. He gained advanced training in vitreoretinal surgery through a fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. Certified by the American Board of Ophthalmology, he joined UT Southwestern in 2022. Dr. Patel has published several articles in peer-reviewed journals related to his areas of interest. In 2022, he received the Golden Apple Fellow Teaching Award from the Department of Ophthalmology at Washington University. We are so glad he is here now at UT Southwestern. Welcome to Science Cafe, Dr. Patel. The virtual podium is yours. Oh, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm so happy to be here. I'm glad to see everyone's cameras on. It almost feels uh, like we're joining in person. Um, so uh, again, thank everybody for uh, making time tonight to um, listen to me talk more about um, eyes. So I want to talk more about aging eyes uh, and kind of some uh, common complex issues that, that we all will face um, as we get older. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, I do want to give a warning. I will be presenting some surgical videos, so if you're a little bit squeamish, just um, FYI. And then uh, some of the surgical techniques I do describe are off-label, so they're not FDA approved. Um, all right. So I want to start by talking about ophthalmology. So there's a lot of confusion um, in, in terms of eye care between ophthalmology, optometry, opticians. So uh, ophthalmology is a medical and surgical field, uh, so we treat uh, eye diseases from simple to complex. It does require quite a bit of training. So um, after college, it's four years of med school, four years of residency, two years of fellowship. So for me to become a vitreoretinal surgeon to specialize in retina surgery, uh, it took me 10 years after college. Um, so it is a surgical field. Optometry, they are also uh, eye care providers. They go to optometry school for four years and they do treat basic eye diseases. They typically don't do surgery, but they specialize more in prescribing glasses and contact lenses. And then optician is another term that you might hear. They don't actually treat eye diseases or prescribe glasses or contacts, but they do specialize in fitting um, eyeglasses and dispensing contact lenses. So how do we do our eye exam in clinic? So if you were to visit me in clinic, this is a, a very similar setup to what you would see. Uh, this little contraption on the left, this is called a slit lamp. And it's uh, essentially a microscope for me to be able to examine the eye, both the, the, the external structures of the eye and also the inside of the eye. In the picture on the right, you can actually see that slit beam uh, allows me to have a really, really magnified view of the eye. So we're able to use this as one of our tools to, to start examining the eye. And then if we wanna look inside the eye, 
we use a set of lenses and other magnifiers. And so I typically use this system on the right. Uh, it's a headset. It's called an indirect ophthalmoscopy. And so it allows me to shine a light um, uh, into this magnifying glass and allows me to focus the light into the eye to, to get an image of the inside. So when I do my exam, I see something like this. This is a, a photo uh, of the retina. And so you can see all the structures inside the eye. This yellow uh, donut is the optic nerve that connects your eye to your brain. All of these red lines are the blood vessels. All this background, that's actually the retina itself, the film that lines the back of the eye that allows us to see. And this darker area here, this is the center part of the vision. This is an area called the macula. So the macula is actually a portion of the retina, but it's responsible for the center portion of the vision. So some people you know, may have heard of something called macular degeneration, which we'll touch on a little bit later, but that involves really this portion of the retina, that, that fine central vision portion. So let's talk a little bit more about anatomy. So this is just a drawing kind of a cross section of the eye. And so the front of the eye is the cornea, that's the clear part. And then you have this empty space um, that's filled with a, a natural liquid that we make an aqueous humor. And you have the, the round part, the colored part of the eye, that's called the iris. And the center of the iris, um, there's an opening. And so that opening is called the pupil. So it's not really an actual structure, it's just the, the lack of a structure there. And right behind the colored part of our eye, right behind the iris sits a lens. So this is a magnifying glass. And this is what uh, really helps us focus uh, a great deal of light that comes into our eye uh, onto the retina so that we can have a clear image. This lens is held in place by these fibers that we call zonules or suspensory ligaments. And then the inside of the eye is filled with a jelly that's called vitreous humor. And then again, as I mentioned before, the back part of the eye is lined with a film that's called the retina. And that's what actually senses the light and that light signal is sent through the nerve back to our brain, and that's how we form an image. And so let's talk about um, a really, really common problem called presbyopia. And what is presbyopia? It's completely normal. It's a normal part of aging, and it's our inability to accommodate. So in other words, it's needing reading glasses. So typically, uh, you know, for people that have never worn glasses before, you know, you have really good uh, vision in the distance for, for uh, most of your life, and then as you get older, you find that it's harder and harder to see things up close. And the reason is naturally our eye, whenever we focus on something up close, that lens will change shape and allow it to magnify light a little bit more. So when you move something up close, you know, let's say to your face, that lens will become more powerful and it will allow it to continue to focus that image. Now, as we get older, that lens and the muscles around it become a little bit less pliable. So you're not able to change the shape of that natural magnifying glass you have inside the eye. So when you put things up close, things become blurry. So for most people, it starts to occur in their 40s. Uh, you may find that you know in your 40s, you have to hold things a little bit further away. And then as you get older, you have to wear reading glasses to, um, to bring the image in focus. And so that's what most people do, use reading glasses. And if you have a prescription that you normally wear for distance, we put it in a bifocal. So you have the top portion for distance and the bottom portion is just a little bit extra magnification to be able to see up close. The other thing that you can do is uh, something called monovision, where you actually target one eye for up close and the other eye for distance. Now, not everybody can tolerate this. And the one thing that you do sacrifice is depth perception. So when we're looking at objects, we actually use both eyes together and our brain is able to uh, focus those both eyes and determine how far objects are. And now if you make one eye sharp for up close and one eye sharp for the distance, your brain has a harder time to bring those images together. So you lose that depth perception. But this is one way that you can correct that presbyopia or the need for essentially reading glasses without wearing glasses. So you can wear actually a contact lens on one eye that has almost like a reading glass in that. And then the other eye can be for distance or you can do it with like a laser surgery. And so the, um, I've been talking a lot about the lens and how that's a really strong magnifying glass. That actually only probably bends about a third of the uh, light that hits our eye. The other two thirds of the light and our ability to focus actually comes from the cornea. And that's the front surf, surf, uh, excuse me, surface of the eye. So one thing you can do is instead of putting contact lens onto that surface, you can actually use a laser and reshape that surface and change how the light behaves. 
So let's talk a little about cataracts. This is kind of a hot topic. Everyone's really curious about this. And I want to start off by saying cataracts are completely normal. Um, it is, uh, I expect everybody to have a cataract. And all it is, is that lens that I've been talking about becoming cloudy. So that lens, it's made up of uh, proteins. We call them alpha and beta crystalline proteins. So I often refer to this natural lens as a crystalline lens. And those proteins are clear when you're born and it allows it to bend light, kind of like a magnifying glass. And it allows it to be clear so that light doesn't uh, scatter and it doesn't um, degrade the image that, that hits your eye. And the cataract has different layers. Um, it's kind of like an M&M. &M. Uh, it's got like a candy shell and we call that a capsule. And then it has the chocolate inside and maybe even a little peanut, depending on how dense or how mature the cataract is. And so over time, as these proteins become um, uh, aged or denature, kind of break down, that lens starts to become cloudy. And that's what we call a cataract. There are some associations with it. You know, the biggest thing is age. Uh, smoking can uh, bring on cataract a little bit faster. Some medical diseases such as diabetes, uh, if you're taking uh, long-term steroid use, that can cause uh, some cataracts and UV light exposure. And so unfortunately, we don't have any way to reverse cataracts. We don't have any eye drops. We don't have any lasers. Um, the only way that we can really get rid of cataracts is sometimes if it's mild enough, we can prescribe glasses. Um, but if it becomes significant enough, really, we have to do a surgery. And when is surgery appropriate? Um, very rarely are there medical reasons for us to take out a cataract. Occasionally, um, we have to take out a cataract because it's causing some type of harm to the eye. But in most cases, we take out a cataract when it's a nuisance to your vision or your daily life. And so just because you have a cataract does not mean that it has to be removed. So if you have a cataract and you're actually able to live your life fully and your ophthalmologist says, you know, there's no medical urgency, then you don't have to have cataract surgery. Now, if it's starting to, you know, affect your ability to drive, you know, play golf, read, um, you're getting a lot of glare, then maybe it's sort of a, a time to start considering surgery. So how do you do surgery? So um, we remove the cataract and typically we use ultrasound energy. So our technology in removing cataracts has come a long way. And so we uh, use a hand piece and I'll show you a video in a little bit where we use a vacuum and ultrasound energy to remove the cataract, but we leave that thin capsule behind, that thin bag that um, holds that cataract, we leave that behind and we use that bag to put an artificial lens implant. So that bag is suspended by those zonules, those little suspension ropes. And then we put the lens implant inside there and that stays stable, hopefully for the rest of your life. So how do we pick what lens goes in your eye? Everyone's eye is a little bit different. Uh, and so not everybody gets the exact same lens. And so this is another uh, place where our technology has come a really, really, really long way. So we're fortunate in our UT Southwestern clinics to have one of the, um, the latest technologies in terms of measuring the eye. So like I said, that cornea, that has two thirds of the power. The natural lens has about a third of the power. So there's a lot of factors that go into what lens uh, goes in your eye, what artificial lens. So we look at the size of the eye, the length, where your natural lens sits, how strong the cornea is. And so one of the machines that we have here, it actually uses a newer technology called optical coherence tomography to shine light into the eye. And it gives us a high resolution picture of the eye and takes really, really accurate measurements to be able to um, allow us to pick the lens model that goes in your eye. And over the last few decades, there have been formulas that we actually plug all these numbers into. So all the measurements for your eyes, we have these complex formulas and depending on the type of lens model that we want to use, that formula will tell us the specific customized power and type of lens to use for the eye. So um, we're able to get very, very accurate readings and able to uh, get very good lens implants in the eye with, with this technology that we have. Now, exactly what type of implant should you get? So we know that we have to sort of customize it for the eye. But there's two major categories of lens implants that we have. I'll call them, you know, monofocal and presbyopia correcting. So essentially monofocal means that that lens implant that we put in your eye will correct your vision for one target, usually distance. So we'll put that lens in your eye 
And our goal is that after the surgery, once you're healed, you'll be able to see really well in the distance, surfing things like driving, looking at street signs, watching you know, movies, watching TV. But then for up close, you would need reading glasses, just like you normally would as you get older. Now, there's newer generation lenses that have come out in the last few decades, and they constantly are, are improving, and they're presbyopia correcting. One of the bigger ones, they're called multifocal lenses. And you can see this picture on the right. This is one of the, the designs that we have. And so what it actually does is it will split light in multiple different directions. So some of the light that this lens will bend will be for distance. Some of the light will be for up close. So when this lens is implanted, it will actually give you clear vision at multiple um, distances, so far away and up close. Now, this lens does have some uh, drawbacks. Uh, some of the lenses have higher incidence of uh, things like glare and reflections. If you have other problems inside the eye, like macular degeneration or severe glaucoma, sometimes you're not a candidate for this lens. And so it really is a discussion to have with, with your ophthalmologist and your surgeon to see if, if you would be a candidate for one of these multifocal lenses. And then one other thing that we can build into these lenses is some correcting for something called astigmatism, which just means that the, the cornea or that front surface of your eye is bent a little bit so that it bends light in one direction more than another. And so we can actually correct that with, with some of the lens implants that we put inside the eye to neutralize some of that astigmatism or some of that additional glasses prescription. And again, that would be a discussion with your ophthalmologist based on what your eye looks like to see whether or not you would require one of these or even be a candidate for one of these types of lenses. This is really exciting. So um, something that just came out recently that we actually have access to at UT Southwestern, uh, two of our doctors, Jeremy Bartley and William Waldrop, um, I think they're, they're starting to implant these. It's a lens called the light adjustable lens. So, you know, I talked that we have these uh, really fancy formulas, these really fancy ways of getting measurements that are very, very accurate, but um, they're not perfect. So after we implant some of these lenses, you might have a tiny, tiny bit of residual glasses prescription. And this lens, a light adjustable lens, what we can actually do is put in a lens that's pretty close to what your, um, what your eye needs. But then if it's a tiny bit off and we weren't able to get 100% of your glasses prescription or your, uh, we call it a refraction kind of dialed in, what we can do is after the surgery, once you're healed, we can use UV light to reshape the lens and to kind of fine tune the lens. Uh, and so this is really exciting because this is the first lens that actually allows us to fine tune the power after the surgery, after it's implanted. Once the lenses are implanted in the eye, it, it becomes uh, a little bit more challenging to take them out and replace the lens. So really we consider it a permanent implant, but this allows us to still customize it after, um, after the surgery, which is really, really exciting. So I'm going to show a quick video of cataract surgery. As you know, UT Southwestern's a teaching institution, so this is one of our, our resident cataract surgeries. What we do is we make an incision, go inside the eye, and just fill the eye with some jelly to kind of keep it formed. We make another incision, and this is only about two and a half millimeters, so it's really, really small. And here we're using a needle, and we're making a hole in the front of that capsule. This is that shell that I was talking about. So we're making a hole in the front of it, a circular round opening, so that we can access it. And we use some fluid here to separate the meat of the lens of the cataract away from that capsule. And then what we can do is use this hand probe and another instrument, and we can um, emulsify the lens. So it's called phaco, which means lens emulsification. So phaco emulsification. And we remove the lens pieces um, using this very, very minimally invasive kind of small incision technique that's become very, very safe, uh, actually. Uh, and, and then the residual lens fragments we can remove with this sort of vacuum. And then at the end, we uh, are able to implant this foldable lens. And once we put it in the eye, it unfolds. And you can see it has kind of two arms and the central kind of magnifying glass or optic. And at the end, we often don't have to use stitches at all. We can just hydrate these wounds or kind of thicken them. And uh, these incisions will self-seal. And so people can have, uh, you know, depending on how dense the cataract is, people can have vision restored uh, almost immediately. You know, the next day you can be seeing much better. One question I often get is, um, what about laser surgery? So this is sort of a picture from a journal, but one thing you can do with cataract surgery is you can use the laser to assist you. Now, we don't have a technology for lasers to completely get rid of cataracts, 
but lasers can assist in certain things like making that capsular opening, making our incisions, and there are benefits to using laser. So in certain situations where you want to have a really, really precise opening for some of these more um, uh, multifocal or premium lenses, sometimes it is beneficial. Uh, but 90% of the surgery is still done by hand. So once the laser does its work, you still have to go in and use that fake emulsification handpiece to or remove the cataract and then also implant the lens by hand. So this would really be a discussion with your with your surgeon to see if you're a candidate, whether it's something they offer um, to, to proceed with this. And so this is actually my specialty. So complex situations. So I really, um, you know, I love doing surgery, but I really like to, to handle the complex things. And that's one reason that, you know, kind of drew me to UT Southwestern. We really have a team of doctors that can handle a lot of these complex situations that, um, you know, are fairly uncommon, but um, uh, not everybody can handle, not every ophthalmologist is, is well equipped to handle. So what if that lens, your cataract falls to the back of the eye? What if you don't have any of that zonular support? What do you do? So um, that's what we do here. So what I have to do is actually a retina surgery. So I go in through the side of the eye uh, and I make these little needle incisions. And again, these also self-seal at the end. I kind of open up the skin here to allow me to insert uh, later on actually the same type of FACO emulsification handpiece, kind of that vacuum. So I go in here, uh, remove the jelly, I put some steroids in the eye and that allows me to stain the jelly to better visualize it. And then what I do is I insert that same type of ultrasound uh, machine with a vacuum to emulsify and eat up that lens. So I'm able to eat it up in the back of the eye. And then um, the, and so we're able to get all the lens pieces out, all the cataract out um, through a more posterior or more approach through the back of the eye. Now, you're taking out the cataract, but how do you put a new lens in, right? Um, that entire capsular bag and the zonules, the zonules are broken, the entire capsular bag and the cataract were in the back of the eye, and yeah, I've removed it, but now we have to figure out a way to put an implant. And so there's different ways that we can put implants in. Once there isn't good primary support, you know, being able to put a lens inside of that bag, we have to talk about secondary places. So we call these secondary intraocular lenses or secondary IOLs. So one place you can put the lens is in front of the iris. So they make special lenses that are designed to actually put in the front of the eye. So not behind the iris where the lens naturally is, but you actually put it in the front. So those are called anterior chamber intraocular lenses. Um, sometimes if you have a little bit of uh, support here, there's a little bit of bag left. Sometimes you can put a lens sort of on top of the bag. That's the sulcus. Um, but again, if you have no support there at all, then we start talking about maybe we have to suture the lens. So the sclera is the white part of the eye. So we can actually suture a lens to the white part of the eye and levitate it here kind of behind the iris. We can do a similar technique where we don't use sutures. Um, and then we can also uh, suture the lens to the iris. So I'm going to show a few of those techniques. And one thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, a lot of these, uh, these are not FDA approved, most of these techniques. And but but we've been doing these for decades, and, and new and more minimally invasive techniques have come out, uh, especially even over the last few years. And there was a, a big study done uh, with the uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology uh, in this uh, big journal, journal called Ophthalmology, and it really showed that there's really no one technique that's better than another. And so it really depends on a, a variety of factors. Um, one is you know what does the eye look like? What is the anatomy of your eye particular? in particular? There are certain techniques that might be better for your eye compared to other people's eyes. And then also, what is the surgeon comfortable with? And so this is that anterior chamber lens that I was talking about. And so it looks a little bit different than our typical lenses that will go inside of the capsular bag, but we can actually just insert it on top of the iris. And uh, then we suture up the main wound here and uh, people can do very, very well with these lenses. Now, what if we want to get a little fancier? Um, there's been a lot of interest in putting lenses sort of behind the iris. Uh, it's more of an anatomic location. It's more of a natural location for a lens to sit. And so uh, there are a variety of lenses that we have available. And the, a lot of these lenses have eyelets or little holes for us to pass suture through. And there's different suture material we can use. The two biggest suture materials that we use for this type of technique, one is called polypropylene suture. It's a non-dissolvable suture. The other one is called Gore-Tex. So, you know, similar to, um, you know, what your rain jackets are made of, it's that same material, but they make it into a thread. 
And it's very um, biocompatible, meaning it's very inert in the eye. It's well tolerated. So I'm going to show a quick video here. So this is a patient that they have no natural lens right now. And so I'm taking this, um, this lens. I'm actually going to cut off the arms because we don't need them. Uh, we're not really putting it inside of that bag anymore because there's no bag. And I'm going to take uh, some of that Gore-Tex suture and I thread it through the eyelids. And the orientation is really important for this technique. And so it, for this lens, you want to have uh, your suture orientation in opposite directions so that the lens doesn't tilt during the surgery or after the surgery. You want that lens to be really stable. And so what I do is uh, I start to hand off the sutures to the correct sites that I'm going to suture through. And I really, again, want to make sure that the suture orientation is correct. And I pass that through all four of these sites. And then I'm able to physically fold this lens. It's made of acrylic, so it's a soft, pliable material hold it into a small incision, put it into the eye. And then what I do is I'm really careful with this. You know, this lens isn't very tight. It's, it's, or it's not very heavy. And so I don't need these sutures to be very tight. So I actually do a slip knot. So I'm able to adjust the tension and I really take my time and I go back and forth and I'm adjusting the tension on each side to make sure that the lens is centered, to make sure that I'm not over tightening it. Uh, because if you do over tighten it, you can't actually break the lens. Um, and, you know, I just take my time to go back and forth and, and really pay attention to the fine details in getting this lens in the right spot. And then once I have the, the correct tension, and I'm happy with it. I can lock down the knot so it doesn't slip anymore. And then I can um, cut the sutures and then really bury the suture so it doesn't uh, erode over time. So what if we don't want to use suture? So there's been a lot of interest in using sort of a suture list technique. So this is another type of lens model that we have. It has a central optic or the central magnifying glass. And then it has these thin, thin arms. And these are called haptics. And so what we found is that um, we can actually take these haptics and pull them out through the sclera, the white part of the eye, and have them embedded in the sclera. And that can actually support the lens itself. So the lens can support itself by just being embedded into the wall of the eye. And then one thing we can do is we can take the tip of these arms, the tip of these haptics, and slightly melt it, and it will create a little bulb or a flange so that it's hard for that uh, haptic or that arm to slide back into the eye. So I'll show a quick video here of that. And so this is actually the same patient I showed earlier where we removed that lens from the back of the eye. So I didn't put a lens in at that time, and at a later point, I, I decided to put in a lens. So I use an, a, a really sharp needle, and I'm making a tunnel into that white part of the eye, the sclera. And then I inject this lens, and I'm taking that arm and docking it into that needle. And then I'm able to really firmly get it in there. And then I just externalize it out, and I use cautery, or just kind of a heat gun here, to create a little bulb there. And I do the same thing on the other side. And then once I feed that in, I externalize it. And I do the same thing. I create a little um, bulb on that side. And then you can just tuck these bulbs in underneath the conjunctiva or the skin of the eye. And um, patients can have really, really, really good visual outcomes. Now, you can also suture to the iris. So this patient, um, he, he, this patient was actually 20, 20 uh, before um, their, not their implant uh, fell to the back of the eye. So they've already had cataract surgery. They had an implant placed, but it fell into the back of the eye because there's some weak support. So I start my surgery. And here you can actually see um, grabbing his implant from, from the back and bring it up on top of the iris, the colored part of the eye. And then um, what I'll do is I'll actually put those arms behind the iris and I'll suture them. So now I have the lens kind of behind the iris in its natural spot, and I'm going to put some suture to wrap that arm of the lens uh, and fixate it to the iris itself so that it won't be able to move or fall away. So I'm able to do that on both sides, and then I tie a knot into the eye and then kind of place the lens kind of back where it belongs, kind of correct the pupil, make sure it's round, make sure it looks nice. And then um, I'm able to cut the knots. And, and this patient actually did really well. So I was able to do a really minimally invasive surgery. I was able to uh, save his existing implant. I didn't have to take the implant out and put a new one in. And he ended up being 20-20 after the surgery. So um, we're going to shift over a little bit and talk about floaters. So um, floaters are different than a cataract. So we talked about that vitreous jelly that's inside of the eye. It really forms most of the eye. 
And uh, that's really where floaters come from. It's opacities inside of that jelly. So the cataract is stationary, so it doesn't really move around. So people can describe floaters as sort of like a mosquito or a gnat or kind of smoke that moves around in their vision. And the reason you see that is because you're seeing that vitreous humor. You're seeing the edge of the jelly. When we're young, that jelly is really formed and uh, it doesn't really reflect light very much. But naturally, over time, that jelly undergoes liquefaction, so it becomes more liquidy. And we call that vitreous senioresis. And you can actually start to see the edge of the jelly as it undergoes that process. That vitreous jelly is attached, actually, to the retina for the majority of your life. And eventually, it will separate away. And when it separates away, we call that a posterior vitreous detachment because that posterior aspect of the vitreous, that back aspect of that jelly has detached away from the retina. So this is different than a retinal detachment. So here's kind of a diagram. So, you know, early on in life, you have this blue vitreous jelly that's attached to the retina. It's attached to the optic nerve. Actually, the optic nerve is the last place that it will pull away from. And so over time, it starts to sort of separate away. So it starts to separate away from here, and then it starts to separate away more from the edges. And it's really adhering to the optic nerve. And eventually, it will separate away from the optic nerve. And you might notice a new floater. Some people will notice it as like a little mosquito or a little C shape or a little donut. And that's actually where the vitreous jelly was attached to the nerve. It's a little ring. We call it a Weiss ring. And I can actually see it on my exam. And on this, this is actually one of my patient's photos. You can actually see the Weiss ring itself, this little floater where the jelly was attached to the nerve and now it's kind of separated off. Now, um, what do you do for floaters? Let's talk about that for a moment. So, um, Generally, your brain will get used to floaters. Um, the Your brain has a really, really good way of adapting to, to these floaters. Now, you may still see them on a bright, sunny day or when you're looking against a, a bright white computer screen, um, but your brain ignores it uh, for the most part. If it's really interfering with your daily life, we can uh, do a surgery to remove all that jelly, but it is a surgery. And so there are risks associated with that. Uh, so I really, you know, that's the type of surgery that I would do uh, as a retina surgeon, but I urge patients actually not to get that surgery unless it's really, really, really interfering with their life. And I think for most people, they can live with it. Um, and so that that's really what I recommend. There are some doctors that might recommend laser. Um, I don't know anybody personally that does laser for floaters, but, you know, if you look online, you might find a, a provider that would do that. When are floaters dangerous? So, um, you know, when you have that posterior vitreous detachment, uh, when that jelly separates away from the back part of the eye, there is actually a risk of it pulling the retina with it. And that can result in a tear in the retina or a retinal detachment. And that's where fluid gets underneath, through that tear underneath the retina and separates the retina away. And that can cause vision loss. So if you have a sudden onset of new floaters and you have flashes along with it, or you start to have peripheral or especially central vision loss, you really have to um, let your eye care provider know because uh, those are all warning signs. And so when are you at higher risk of something um, bad happening with this posterior vitreous detachment or with your floaters? So if there's a hemorrhage associated with it, so if you see a lot of floaters or a doctor tells you that there's a hemorrhage inside the eye, that can be associated with um, uh, something more serious. If you have something called lattice degeneration, which just means you have thin areas in your retina, or areas where that vitreous is very adherent to the retina, that can predispose you to um, uh, something more serious. If you're very, very, very nearsighted, we call that myopia, then that can predispose you to um, uh, uh, tears, or if you've had a retinal attachment in the other eye. So if you have, you know, uh, this, this is a patient that had a lot of floaters, and they actually had a hemorrhage inside the eye, and I couldn't uh, examine the eye well enough to rule out a tear or anything like that. And so I told him, you know, I can't rule out a tear or a large retinal detachment. So I was able to clean out this blood so you can see it's really, really a hazy view. So I'm cleaning out the blood, cleaning out this jelly. And when I examine his retina, he actually has a tear um, in, the, in the corner of his retina. And so I'm able to treat it with laser. This is before he had vision loss from a retinal detachment. So I'm able to treat this patient with laser before they have a more serious complication. So this is what a retinal detachment looks like. Um, this is a green and yellow, uh, sorry, green and red photograph. So it's not completely true color representation, but you have a lot of fluid that kind of gets underneath the retina and it can separate the, the retina off, off the ba uh, back wall. Let's talk about macular degeneration. So um, we call this age-related macular degeneration or AMD for short. And this occurs uh, with age. 
right? And so we don't see in everybody, but if if um, uh, we do see in people that are older, we see a lot in uh, the Caucasian population, people that have lighter colored eyes. And it is uh, some type of probably oxidative damage and some type of inflammation that leads to damage in the macula or the center part of the vision. And so the hallmark of this disease is these drusen. So these sort of, uh, these kind of round lumpy deposits that are underneath the retina. And we don't know um, 100% what caused macular degeneration, but we're finding out more and more some genetic risk factors. And we're finding out that there's probably some component of the immune system that, that comes into play and particularly uh, an immune pathway called a complement uh, pathway. So some of the risk factors include age, like we discussed, uh, smoking, and there's genetics as well. So there's uh, certain markers that that um, that we know are associated with macular degeneration. We know that it can run in families. And macular degeneration comes in two flavors. So there's the dry form or the non-exudative, um, and then there's the wet form or neovascular. And so the dry form is where you just have these drusen, you can get some atrophy or damage to the retina. And the wet form is where you're eye starts to make new blood vessels. And we'll talk about that in a second. So these, this is um, a, a really high resolution photo that we're able to get. And so this is, these, these are the kinds of photos I get, you know, um, almost every single clinic on, on many of my patients. And this is a cross section of the retina. This little dip is actually the center part of the vision. That's where you focus light. And then these little bumps here, those are those little drusen. Those are the little findings that we see in macular degeneration. And so, um, what do we do? You know, we don't have a complete cure for macular degeneration. Um, most of the vision loss comes from the retina either dying off or from getting scarring from new blood vessels growing. So the biggest thing is stop smoking. So we know that smoking has a really, really high association with macular degeneration. So, um, you know, cutting back smoking as much as possible, stopping it. I really urge my patients to, to, to cut back as much as possible or stop it if possible. And then there's uh, ocular multivitamins that have been studied. Uh, there's a formulation called uh, AREDS2, A-R-E-D-S-2, and it was a scientific study shown to slow down the progression of dry macular degeneration. And then there's really exciting newer therapies that have been shown to work on this um, immune system and maybe slow down the damage that occurs. And that's all for dry macular degeneration. Now, if you start to have new blood vessels growing and you have this wet form, then we do have medications. Uh, unfortunately, we have to inject it into the eye. They're intravitreal, but they're really good at slowing down and controlling that blood vessel growth and limiting scar tissue that gets caused by that. Uh, back before we had these agents, people lost a lot of vision from macular degeneration, especially wet macular degeneration. And we're really, really able to um, save people's vision for a uh, much longer period of time than we used to be able to. So there's different ways that we can really grade macular degeneration, uh, kind of early, intermediate, late, depending on the eye findings. This top picture here is a picture of late, dry macular degeneration. You can see this sort of ring in the center. That's where the retina has actually died off. So it leaves like a blind spot in your vision. And this bottom is where uh, there's a blood vessel that grew in wet macular degeneration and actually caused uh, bleeding in the retina. And so um, this is sort of what you might notice, you know, a little blind spot and over time it might get bigger and it's really in the center part of the vision. So we're not talking about the peripheral vision really being affected by macular degeneration. We're just talking about the central kind of really important part to look at people's faces, read um, the newspaper, watch TV, things like that. And so the, uh, the formulation that was studied, um, it's available over the counter. There's a lot of different eye vitamins, but the scientific study that was done to show the decreased rate of progression from this intermediate stage macular degeneration to an advanced stage uh, contains a bunch of different vitamins, antioxidants. Um, and then, like I mentioned, there's been a lot of new st um, study and uh, developments in terms of looking at gene therapies or inhibiting the immune system. And so uh, we there was just a medication that was released a few months ago, actually, uh, back in early 2023, that uh, inhibited one of those complement factors, uh, protein C3, and it can slow down the growth of, you know, atrophy. Not It doesn't cure it, it slows it down by maybe about, you know, 20%. And so it's something, it's not great, but it is really the first step in us having a lot other uh, therapies available. And then wet macular degeneration, this is that same type of um, OCT or optical coherence tomography image on the right. You can see this kind of these black areas that's fluid. And we have these medications that work against um, 
these um, blood vessel components to really make these blood vessels go away. The two big ones are uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, and then ANG2 is a newer one that we've been targeting now. And um, one of the big uh, anti-VEGF uh, agents that we've used is, is Avastin. It was first actually approved for colorectal cancer back in the early 2000s. And we soon thereafter started using even Avastin for the eye off-label. And there's been other uh, a lot of other uh, medications that are FDA approved, but um, all of them work fairly similarly in terms of being able to regress the um, blood vessels. Some of them do have multiple components and might be able to extend out the interval or dry out the fluid a little bit better. And so it's really it's up to um, your treating ophthalmologist to decide which agent would be uh, most appropriate. So let's talk about diabetes real quick, maybe for a minute or two, kind of running out of time. Um, so diabetes is a leading cause of blindness. And essentially what happens in diabetes is the elevated blood sugars cause damage to the blood vessels in the body. And in the eye, that causes lack of blood flow to the eyes. And so there's different stages of diabetes in the eyes from uh, really early to very, very late stages. And we have ways of staging it from uh, uh, non-proliferative or NPDR to proliferative uh, or PDR. And non-proliferative just means that there's changes in the eye from the diabetes, but your eye hasn't started to make new blood vessels or scar tissue just yet. And then PDR is really the late stages of diabetes in the eyes. And that's where your eye is trying to make new blood vessels, trying to heal itself, but it does a really bad job. So it can lead to scar tissue, can lead to bleeding. Uh, these are some of the changes that we see. We see kind of small areas of bleeding. Sometimes you see new blood vessels growing and what it can do is it can actually um, cause you know, massive hemorrhaging in the eye that, that we have to treat with surgery and things like that. And the same type of medications that uh, we can use to treat um, macular degeneration, we can actually use to treat diabetes as well. So a lot of these anti-VEGF agents are being used for diabetes in addition to uh, lasering off all the sick areas of the eye. But the biggest thing is to decrease the, um, the, the, the diabetes systemically. So we know we have studies that show that improving the diabetes control can actually reduce the risk of getting severe retinopathy and your, the diabetes worsening in the eye. So I really encourage, you know, it's really difficult to, to get diabetes under control in some people that have severe diabetes, but I really do kind of work with their, their primary care doctors and endocrinologists to try to um, control their whole body. So I'm going to leave it at that so that we have some uh, time for questions, but thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, attention and your time and for inviting me out to speak. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for your presentation. That was very, very informative, and we have a lot of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, we will now begin the Q&A portion of this program, starting with a few questions that were submitted in advance by uh, registrants before going to the chat. And the first uh, question, Dr. Patel, is how do you know when it's time for cataract surgery? And is UT Southwestern more advanced in cataract treatment and or treatment than any other eye diseases? So, yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's very rarely are there medical uh, reasons to remove the cataract. Sometimes the cataract can be causing damage to your eye, in which case we have to remove it pretty promptly. But really, it's a matter of, um, is it affecting your daily life? And it's really the ophthalmologist's job to look at the cataract, look at how mature the cataract is, and to look for other signs that might be causing vision loss, right? Just because you have a cataract does not mean that that's the cause of your vision loss. You could have a cataract and macular degeneration. So um, it's really, you know, it's up to your surgeon, your ophthalmologist to make that recommendation. And, uh, you know, at UT Southwestern, we have a variety of doctors that, that treat all different eye diseases. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, we have some of the, um, some some really great tools to to allow us to treat our patients to to a higher quality. So, you know, I'm really happy to have all the tools that we have, and I can't imagine practicing elsewhere. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for that answer. I want to ask this question. We did uh, receive quite a few um, questions about eye drops, and then there's a couple of questions in the chat about eye drops as well. So, if you don't mind, um, are there any recommended over-the-counter lubricant drops that would help with uh, dryness? Sure. Yeah. So, one thing that I didn't really touch on that, that a lot of us face over time is our eyes start to get dry, and so um, you know we're in a day and age where we're looking a lot at computer screens, looking at our tablets, our phones, and we tend not to blink a lot. We tend to dry out our eyes, uh, especially in the summer when the AC is on or the winter when we have the heater on. 
And so what I really recommend is to use just over-the-counter lubricating drops, um, not the type that are for like uh, red eye, but just um, artificial tears. And there's a lot of different brands. I don't really have any particular brand that I recommend, but you know, you can use that, you know, anywhere from four to six times per day. Um, they make the type that, you know, come in bottles. They also make the type that are preservative free, which some people find a little bit more soothing or a little bit more delicate or gentle for their eyes. And so that's what I really start to recommend um, just for, you know, general dryness and general uh, lubrication for the eyes to make them feel better. Thank you. The next question uh, comes from our chat as well. Um, can you talk about clotting that happens to sickle cell patients? Sure. So um, sickle cell disease, it's a um, disease of the uh, red blood cells in the body. So we all normally have red blood cells in the body and they carry oxygen to, to all parts of our body. And in a disease called sickle cell disease, those red blood cells are abnormally shaped. And what can happen is sometimes those abnormally shaped blood, vessel, uh, blood cells can actually get stuck into these small little blood vessels. So the eyes are really, really small structure. And so we have really small blood vessels in the eyes. And so, so, so in sickle cell patients, they can actually get loss of blood flow to parts of their retina. Um, and what it can do is it can uh, create a picture very similar to other eye diseases. You know, in diabetes, we also have loss of blood flow to parts of the retina. There's also other conditions like vascular occlusions, like vein occlusion that can cause blood flow to, to not get to the retina. And so in, in all these conditions, um, uh, sometimes if there's just a little bit of area that there isn't blood flow, the eye ignores it. But in other situations, the eye starts to make scar tissue or bad new blood vessels. And that's sometimes what we see in sickle cell disease. Now, the tricky part is that there's no consensus in how to best treat sickle cell patients. Right. So when you have these areas of scar tissue, we'll use a combination of these injection medications that I uh, mentioned. Sometimes we'll just observe them. Sometimes we'll do laser. Sometimes we'll require surgery. So it's really dependent on the particular type of eye disease that that person is presenting with. Thank you. I'm going to go back to cataract, uh, to cataract real quick. Um, Jerry asked, following cataract surgery, can lenses be replaced later with another lens that is more advanced? So that's really tricky. So the, um, the easiest time to put a lens inside of the eye and the least risky time to put a, a lens implant in the eye is at the time of cataract surgery. What happens is that that bag that holds that lens implant in place, that natural bag that we use, it will actually um, almost scar down to that lens implant. So once that implants in the eye, yes, Technically, maybe we could replace it, but it becomes very, very challenging. So there's a high risk of actually damaging that entire support structure. There's a high risk that we can't put a new lens implant in. And so for really what we consider, we consider those implants permanent. And so unfortunately, you know, it's not very easily replaceable. Now, you know, if there's a big problem with the implant or the implant kind of falls out of place, of course, we might have to replace it. But we try not to do it um, if there isn't an, an urgent reason to do it. Thank you. Um, are there any thoughts about infrared light therapy on, on AMD? So there's been a lot of interest in sort of um, uh, light therapy and how light might affect the eyes. As far as I know, there's no uh, strong evidence that there's no, nothing that's been approved. I know there's a lot of people that will market different types of light therapies for different types of eye diseases. Um, but as far as I know, uh, there's nothing that's been shown to be uh, very effective, but uh, you know, we're constantly doing research, so I'm hopeful that there will be less invasive ways for us to treat eye disease like macular degeneration. Thank you. Okay, is DE3 an effective eye vitamin for MGD? So uh, I believe we're talking about like fatty acids. So MGD is uh, mybobian gland dysfunction. So we talked about dry eyes just a little bit. I mentioned lubricating drops. So the, the tears that your eye makes is actually made up of uh, multiple components. Um, it's not just tears. You have you know proteins in it. You have actually tears and uh, uh, fats, like lipids. And so MGD 
my Wobian gland dysfunction is uh, a, an eye disease where you don't make those uh, lipids as well, those fats as well. So your tear film isn't as stable. And so there's some interest, um, you know, I think there's some data to show that, you know, some doctors might prescribe omega-3 uh, or fish oil pills to help produce uh, more um, robust uh, tears. Uh, the other thing I, I sometimes recommend is for people that have eyelid disease, just to, to try doing warm compresses. Um, that can really uh, help to sort of uh, loosen up those oil glands. You know, instead of them being like butter, you can sort of uh, melt it in a way and allow the oil to flow a little bit more. And then for people that have uh, blepharitis or, or other uh, inflammation around the eyelids, some doctors might recommend uh, ointments um, or eyelid scrubs but that really be up to uh, um, you and your ophthalmologist to, to talk about and decide if that's appropriate for you. Thank you. Um, our next question is also from the chat. Uh, the question is, when should you see the ophthalmologist with a possible detached retina? And can you tell the difference between that and a floater? I would say as soon as possible. So like ASAP. So if it is a, um, if you're seeing your optometrist at uh, 5 p.m. on a Friday night, and they say your vision is great, but you have a retinal detachment, you need to see somebody um, before the next week, right? You need to see somebody that weekend. Uh, and so if it's, you know, if you can't get into see a retina specialist, sometimes that means going to the emergency room where there is a retina doctor. Um, not all the emergency rooms have uh, ophthalmology on staff. So uh, UT Southwestern is one that has ophthalmologists. Uh, you know, we have residents in training that, that will really see you. And then if, you know, they'll diagnose the problem and, um, and, and go to the next level, uh, you know, either I'll have to, you know, I'll see you in the emergency room or, or one of our fellows. But um, I would say if you have a retinal detachment, uh, we want to see it immediately. And the, the floaters is the tricky part. Right, so when you have a posterior vitreous attachment, when that jelly separates away from the retina, you can get new floaters. So it's sometimes hard to distinguish a floater from that or just a normal kind of age-related floater from a floater associated with a tear or retinal detachment. Now, if you have vision loss associated with the floater, then of course I have a higher suspicion that you have something serious going on. But if you don't have vision loss and you're just seeing a floater, or maybe you're seeing occasional flashes, it is really something that, you know, we want you to see an eye doctor to just at least do an eye exam to, to rule out something serious. And it's really tough for me to say, yes, you have a retinal detachment or no, you don't just based off that one symptom. Thank you. We have a couple of questions about uh, glaucoma that was pre-submitted and that are in the chat today. Okay. Um, can you clarify, can you tell us what glaucoma is cl and clarify angular glaucoma and how to treat it? Yes. Yeah, so um, glaucoma is a term that a lot of people have heard about. Um, it's different than cataracts. So we talk about cataracts quite a bit. That's the lens inside the eye. So glaucoma is a completely different disease process. So glaucoma is a type of uh, nerve damage. So that nerve that connects your eye to the brain, we can actually see the tip of that nerve. That was a yellow disc that I showed in some of my photos. We can see the tip of that nerve. And we find that in some patients, they have this very characteristic type of loss of that nerve or nerve damage. And um, this pattern of loss we call glaucoma. And one of the biggest risk factors that we see that's associated with that is having a high eye pressure. Okay, so having a very, very high eye pressure can be one of the predisposing risk factors for developing glaucoma, and that's damage to the nerve. Now, not everybody that has a high eye pressure will get glaucoma, and not everybody that has glaucoma will have a high eye pressure. But typically, um, you know, our treatments for that type of eye disease would be to lower the eye pressure. And glaucoma is, in most people, a long-term disease. And we call that um, open angle glaucoma. And the reason that we call it that is the angle is a structure that actually drains the fluid from the eye. And so if that angle is open, you're still draining fluid, but it's not draining very well, so we're calling it glaucoma. So your angle is open, that drainage system is open, and um, uh, for some reason it's not draining well enough or you're producing too much fluid. And so what we do is we treat it with medications to either drain it more or produce less fluid to lower your eye pressure. And then there's another type of glaucoma called angle closure glaucoma, which means that that drainage system actually can get closed off. And when that gets closed off, 
your eye is constantly producing fluid, but it has nowhere to go. And so that can be a very um, more urgent and serious situation. And so I talked about, you know, there's very few times where a cataract can be dangerous. Sometimes in some people's eyes, the cataract can actually get big enough that it pushes up against that iris, the colored part of the eye, and it can actually close off that angle. And so, um, you know, angle closure glaucoma is actually one of the reasons that we might push somebody to get cataract surgery, even if they were seeing well, you know, with their cataract, even though it wasn't maybe bothering their, their vision, it might be a reason for us to, to remove the cataract to, to allow that angle to open back up again. We can also do other laser treatments, um, things like that to try to open the angle, but it really depends on your eye and, and, and your ophthalmologist. Perfect. So our next question, uh, we had a few, again, that was pre-submitted and then a few that are in the chat as well about eye health. What can we do to improve our eye health? Um, can you suggest any nutrition, um, eye exercises, lighting, et cetera, that could help us with this? So I think it's a combination of things. So, um, you know, of course, having a well-balanced diet is, is key. So eating leafy green vegetables, you can get a lot of those antioxidants that are available in those oral uh, macro degeneration pills. So I always tell people to have a well-balanced diet. Um, there's, you know, uh, wearing UV protection when you're outside uh, can really help protect your eyes. And then it's, it's doing things to make sure your eyes are comfortable. So, you know, when we're spending a lot of time at the computer, people often uh, talk about eye fatigue. Uh, and it's sort of this, um, it's not really well-defined term, right? But it's probably a combination of things. You know, people's eyes get tired, they get blurry, especially towards the end of the day. So I tell people, you know, when they're um, uh, using their computer screen or their tablet, take some breaks here and there, kind of look away from your tablet, you know, use some artificial tears, remember to blink um, and just, uh, you know, keep your eyes lubricated. Um, and th those are kind of the biggest things that, that I would recommend in addition to just having a yearly eye exam. Right. So, you know, as we get older, we start to have these changes that you may not notice. You know, we don't people don't notice when they have glaucoma. It's a very slow change. People don't really notice that they have macular degeneration when it's early. People don't necessarily notice that they have a cataract until it's a little more progressed. So, uh, you know, having at least an annual eye exam to be able to check on some of these things that you might not notice, but we can check on our exams uh, can be really beneficial to making sure your eyes stay healthy. Thank you. Now we've talked about uh, cataract, we've talked about glaucoma. Uh, one of the questions that uh, came through in the chat was how common are cancers of the eyes? So that's a really good question. So um, cancers are, uh, um, I would say rare in the eye, right? So it's not like it's, it's a very, very common thing, but we do see it. And, um, you know, at UT Southwestern, we actually have a world-renowned ocular oncologist that is now the head of our department, Dr. William Harbour. And he just came on a few years ago, and he's an ocular oncologist. And, um, you know, that, that's one reason I really recommend people have a yearly eye exam, because just like you can have a freckle on your skin, you can have actually a freckle inside your eye. And sometimes a freckle is just a freckle. But occasionally, a freckle is more than a freckle, and it's something more serious. And this might not be something you uh, notice. And again, it's not very common, but it's something that we can easily see on an eye exam. Uh, and so um, we have ways of treating it. Um, you know, this is kind of beyond the scope of what we talked about in this talk, but we have ways of diagnosing it. We can actually take a sample uh, from the eye. We can run it for genetic analysis. We can look at it under a microscope. Um, we can treat it with uh, radiation. We can actually make like a gold um, implant with radiation seeds, and we can actually sew it onto the eye to treat a tumor. And so we leave it on for a few days, and then we do another surgery to take it off. Uh, we can do like external radiation, uh, something called like proton beam. And so there's a lot of ways of, of treating it and managing it. Um, fortunately, it's not very common uh, to answer the question. Thank you. Um, here's another question about floaters. How often um, should a patient with floaters uh, check up with an ophthalmologist for this condition? And what are the things that patients with floaters should do or not do to reduce and avoid the risk of having retinal detachment? So um, I'll answer the second part of that question first. So I don't know if there's anything that you can necessarily do to really um, decrease your risk for retinal detachment other than, you know, uh, maybe avoid 
uh, boxing or like mixed martial arts, <laughs> just avoid having a bunch of black eyes. But uh, in terms of um, follow up, when people have that posterior vitreous detachment, when that jelly separates away from the retina, that time period is probably the, the highest risk that people will develop a retinal tear. And so if I know that somebody developed that recently, let's say they told me that they started having flashes and floaters a few days ago, and I see them in my clinic and I see that they had a new posterior vitreous detachment. They, I saw that jelly separate away, but I don't see a tear. I'll actually follow up pretty frequently. And so there's no consensus in, in how often to follow up, but really for the first few months, you know, I may take a look, but then after that, uh, you know, if you've had this vitreous detachment or your floaters have been stable for many years, the risk of you developing something new is much lower. And so we, we might be okay with just a yearly follow-up. So it really depends on what your eye looks like uh, and what your ophthalmologist decides is appropriate. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, can you talk about treatment options for severe myopia in the aging population in retinal and retinal detachment? Sure. So myopia is being nearsighted. Okay, so it's another term for that. So what that means is um, uh, you can't see far away but even without glasses, you can actually see up close. So that's nearsightedness. And so a lot of, you know, I'm nearsighted. You can see I'm wearing glasses. And so um, I wear glasses to correct for that. So I wear glasses. I'm able to see in the distance with the glasses. Uh, and then up close, uh, I haven't quite become presbyopic, so I don't need reading glasses yet, but I can see up close by naturally flexing my lens. Eventually, I'll have to have an extra little magnifier in the bottom portion of my glasses to help focus that. So um, over time, as we get older, really the safest way to correct for myopia is, is to wear glasses or contact lenses. We don't have a great way of, of fixing the myopia as an adult. There are some studies that have been shown that um, as a child, there might be some um, like dilating eye drops or paralyzing eye drops for the eyes that might reduce the progression of this nearsightedness when you're young. But um, as an adult, you really your eye is more or less formed. And so uh, the safest thing is to treat it with glasses or contact lens. But once your cataract gets um, uh, significant enough, we can actually, when we replace the uh, the cataract with the lens implant, we can build a lot of your old glasses prescription into that lens implant. So now without glasses, you can see really well in the distance. And then for up close, you may still need reading glasses, or if you get one of those multifocal lenses, you may not need glasses. Uh, the other option is to get something called like LASIK or PRK or laser surgery on the front of the eye. And all that does is it reshapes the front of your eye uh, to be able to focus light a little bit more. Now, in the aging population, I get a little bit more hesitant about recommending LASIK just because you're, especially if you're getting close to needing cataract surgery, you realize, say, just hold off for another few years and you'll probably need a cataract surgery anyways, and we can avoid this additional procedure. But sometimes LASIK, uh, LASIK procedure or a refractive surgery procedure is appropriate. Uh, so it's, again, up to uh, your ophthalmologist and for you to talk about what's best for you and your lifestyle and your eyes. Thank you, Dr. Patel. So many great questions and uh, thank you definitely for your answers. Um, I have another question uh, from Cynthia. Uh, will the eye heal from light sensitivity impairing vision um, caused by non-infectious inflammation of the eye? Uh, so this is a very complex topic. So um, you can have uh, inflammation in all parts of the body, including the eyes. So some of y'all might have heard about rheumatoid arthritis. So it's a type of arthritis that is actually inflammatory. So it's different than just kind of the normal wear and tear arthritis. Uh, some of you may have heard of something called lupus, uh, which is another autoimmune condition. Um, there's a lot of autoimmune conditions that can affect the body. There's also autoimmune conditions that can affect the eyes. So you can actually get inflammation in the eyes, and we call that non-infectious because there's no infection, uh, uveitis, which is a term for inflammation in the eyes. And so when that happens, um, you can have light sensitivity when it's active. Uh, and so um, the inflammation can, can cause irritation in the eye. You can have light sensitivity, decreased vision. Um, it can also um, affect the retina, right? So it can affect how the retina functions. You can get retinal damage. So it can change how you... Um, perceive light and, and how you might be sensitive to light or how you might adjust to light. And so I don't know if there's, there's not a great way of, of 
unfortunately right now fixing the retina, but we have a lot of ways of controlling that inflammation with um, eye drops, with injections, with actually systemic medications. We can treat their whole body inflammation, uh, which also treats the eye. Um, so there's a lot of different therapies, but unfortunately some of that um, kind of light ad adaptation or light sensitivity, I mean, other than treating the active inflammation, I don't know if we have a lot to offer, unfortunately. Okay, Dr. Patel, this is the last question. Um, we know we can burn our eyes if we look at a solar eclipse without eye protection. Can normal sun exposure hurt or, or, or burn our eyes? And then as a secondary question to that, do expensive sunglasses make a difference in protecting eyes from bright sun? Okay, so um, there is actually a condition called solar retinopathy. So you can actually um, essentially burn a hole in the center part of your vision by staring at the sun. So that's really the reason that we tell people not to look at like an eclipse, uh, because you get a really, really high amount of solar energy that goes into the eyes. Now, you know, sometimes you can actually get that with a laser. Uh, people will look into a laser and get that same type of damage in the center, and you'll get a blind spot right in the middle. Now, normal sunlight exposure um, should not cause that type of uh, damage, right? So just being out in the sun, having a picnic, going out to the lake, um, it shouldn't really cause that type of damage. But uh, it can, you know, UV exposure can affect the eyes. Um, we're, there's still a lot that we don't know about the eyes, but there might be some association, like I said, with cataracts. So I do recommend to, you know, wear sunglasses when you're outside. There are some other retinal disorders that can be affected by uh, sunlight. We know that um, sunlight does cause something that we call free radicals or oxidative damage uh, to the eye. And so uh, I always recommend to wear anything with UV protection. And so I don't necessarily have one brand of lenses or glasses to recommend over another, whether it's cheap or expensive. But the most important thing is that you have a, a lens that is good at blocking UV light. Uh, so a, a UV lens. And most people's even, you know, glasses, most uh, just clear glasses, I think a lot of manufacturers will put a UV filter into it. And a lot of sunglasses that you get will have a UV filter as well. Okay, that was fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for your presentation and taking our questions on diseases, conditions, and treatments for aging eyes. And thank you, everyone, for staying with us past our usual end time. We just had so many insightful questions that we wanted to get to as many as possible. And I do believe we'll be doing another pro program like this at a future Science Cafe. To all of our guests, many thanks for joining us and engaging with us, um, as I said, with your great questions, and to my public affairs team of Charlie and Javelin, as well as our UT Southwestern colleagues, Jennifer Romer and Terry Tabaneg in ophthalmology, and our social team of Sierra Busby, India Foster, and Christine Duria for supporting our episode. We are finalizing program details for the closing program of our spring season, and we will be back with that on June 15th focused on the connection between gut health and depression with UT Southwestern's Dr. Jane Foster. So stay tuned for program information to be emailed to you soon. For now, we wish each of you a good health and good wellness and a good night. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>